everyone. We're going to get started in another minute. Um, uh, for those of you, this is a little different with the Super Saturday Recovery Summit. So for those of you uh, that haven't joined one of um, our event in April or Dr. David's this morning, um, so we don't go to the people requesting to share. You'll get X'd out of there, but you can IM any questions of uh, to me and then after Rachel's done presenting um, and there's time for questions, I will ask them of her, but this is being recorded. So it will be part of the in the rooms library. And so we want to keep um, the anonymity, et cetera. And we want to keep it to just asking questions. So I am questions to me and I'll be happy to, to ask them. Hi, Rachel. Great to see you. I'm going to publish you. So hey, you know, there I am. There you are. Yes. <laughs> I'm not as good with this right platform. In. So I apologize, but um, no I, I'm learning a, a few more of these. I um and and I'll be good to go. But so June 20th will be the third monthly uh Super Saturday Recovery Summit. We'll be announcing the lineup for that this week. So but I want to get started. I pulled up your um I'm I'm not gonna read the whole bio, but some of the fascinating things about Rachel. She's going to talk about healthy love, um, but but she's a master integrative coach in shadow work. Um, you know, she, she puts in her bio, conceived under the Hollywood sign in 1960 in Los Angeles. I just think that's so fascinating. I was conceived under the sign, but, um, you know, it's sex, drugs, <laughs> rock and roll. But what I really love, practicing what I preach, I turned my wounds into wisdom after then stepping into the path of the 12-step recovery, you know, through the program, you know, met your Miami friend, Debbie Ford, you know, so, so you're, it's a journey. It's always a journey for all of us in recovery. Um, I, you know, but I, I really appreciated the practicing what I preach, you know, I, I, I want, I love that. So, so I'm going to turn it over to you. This will be recorded again. For those of you that want to ask questions, you IM them to me and I will, um, I will um, ask them after Rachel's done presenting, but this is a presentation rather than, um, you know, the interactive meetings that of the normal space. So a very, a very different format, but intentional. Yeah. So. So can I ask you a question about that, Tammy? Yeah. Since it's also new for me too. Yeah. Uh, the, so uh, nobody is able to come up and share. Correct, and that's what we had we had kind of talked about that. So that you're going to do your presentation, and then we'll have time at the end for questions and answers. So. Um, um, so, because I work a lot more interactively, so there's no way to make that happen, huh? Uh, it's being recorded, and the. This this was this is intentionally different than your normal meeting space. So Rachel's right. on Thursday has a Thursday night at 9 p.m. Um, group um, that you can go and ask questions. But um, yeah, the, the, the so the other presenters have had slides that they've been you know going through and you know, sharing from, and then um, then questions are asked from there. But yeah, we are intentionally we want the anonymity, um, and so we are not. Um, uh, letting people pop up and share. So, oh, so you're doing it because of the anonymity factor. Right. This being recorded, and 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 well, and this is a presentation style rather than just people asking questions. So, so that that's what the purpose of the Super Saturday Recovery Summit is: is to have you know the the guests be able to share a presentation, and then people ask questions, you know, following that. So. Okay. Apparently, there was confusion about that. I'm sorry. I, 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 I uh, apparently it's my bad. I had asked for slides, and um, apparently, we've had a miscommunication on this. So, I apologize to all of you presenting, but let's see where this goes. So, well, that's the whole wonderful thing about yes. starting something is that there's so much to learn, like you yes. said. Yeah. And so, learning in this medium. So, great. Well, just like that. I will be presenting instead of, and so uh, because I, so I'm ready whenever you are. So you want me to just take Have over? It. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to usually it's the healthy love room that I get to meet you here. And 
and I usually get to introduce myself in the way that I am Rachel Levy and I am committed to healthy love. And so I will begin as I always do. And I am so grateful to be here in this summit with you in this Super Saturday Recovery Summit and to be able to share uh, share about healthy love and share about this 12-step inspired program and because I so much love a dialogue um, so much more than a monologue and yes I have so much to teach I, I am a teacher of healthy love as well as a uh, therapist and so uh, in my practice I also get to teach and uh, so that there will be a way for us to interact and I'm going to figure that out because I'm oh, just they, they absolutely grateful. can type in questions through the I am and okay. I mean that's how so this works but you know I would really like you to start at a foundation of what is healthy love you know I mean I think I think for those of us in um, in addiction, we do, you know, we do everything in probably not the most healthy way. So I think even clarifying what, you know, what is healthy love? How how would I know if I'm in healthy love or not healthy love or what I'm doing is is a good choice? <laughs> um, that's a great question, Tammy. And so uh, the, the, just even the question, what is healthy love? And it's interesting because I wanted, I'm going to be sharing all kinds of resources as I answer this great question that I'm living in because we teach what we need to learn, don't we? And so what is healthy love is still this ongoing uh, exploration. And because of my journey, uh, which I'll share a lot more about, uh, that led me to healthy love. I always say that I came from crazy love. And that led me to on the path of having to learn about healthy love and what is healthy love. And the interesting thing is that when people hear healthy love and the healthy love program, they immediately think that it's for relationships, you know, for partner relationships. And healthy love actually begins with ourselves. And health, healthy love actually begins within. And so, you know, we have all these models for relationship and models for love, what we call love. Um, and as I was uh, preparing, uh, I go into this process in preparation, and I and and just like uh, I think that's where we get inspiration from and teachings from. There's so many memes and and so many ways of learning today. You know, once upon a time they said there is no manual, but now there actually are so many manuals. It's hard to decipher which manual do I look into, who do who, what teacher do I learn from, and so I I went. Uh, to look at love, the meaning of love. I thought, you know what? I'm going to have to answer this question. What is healthy love? Let's look and see, well, what is love? And I typed in, and I want to give this to you as my first resource. So my hope is that for everyone who is listening uh, here, that uh, you take notes and, and for resources that can support you in your commitment to healthy love, because that's what we're here for, is this commitment to healthy love. And so this first resource that I want to give you is uh, to type love in your search bar uh, from your computer, and you will get... Uh, and if you don't get this, you can always reach out to me, but uh, you'll get uh, a response from wiki quotes. And that's what you want, love and wiki quotes. And it is pages upon pages of qu amazing quotes from teachers over the time. Uh, all kinds of teachers from Anna Anais Nin, I mean, anybody you could think of, Eric Fromm, all the humanistic psychologists, uh, and uh, of what love is. And so uh, in my answer to what is healthy love is healthy love is really conscious love. Healthy love is our commitment to wholeness. And so it's, it's recovering our whole selves. You know, the, in shadow work, 
which we'll get further into in the four pillars of healthy love uh, and, and the journey that led me to become a teacher of healthy love and to found a 12-step inspired program for healthy love, you know, there were actually four main pillars that I've integrated uh, into uh, learning about healthy love. So that's my first uh, answer to you. And then we could build from there, Tammy, since I realize that this is going to be a beautiful dialogue between us. With questions, but but it was funny as I was asking what is healthy love, someone was typing that in. So so it's great. So um, are, you're the ones that you're you will be receiving the uh... yes they they come in through me, but I yes yeah, so so the follow up to this how do you get both partners on the same page? So that's a great question too. So I don't know if you want to continue through the pillars and kind of explore all of that or yeah, you tell I, me how you want to do that. Yeah, I, I think what I'd like to do, if you will allow me, is I think I would like to go into what it is. That would be and, helpful. And then questions can what questions that can arise from from either what I've shared or like that kind of question or Perfect. other questions. That that would be fantastic. Okay, then we're here for you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, so I'm going to begin with sharing more about me and my journey uh, because I think that our stories, that very much our stories, are essential. That the first step. So, it's why I developed a 12-step inspired program for healthy love is to integrate there's so many teachings for for relationship for relationship with ourselves and then relationship with all the relationships that are important to us i am a relationship therapist so of course i do work with couples and i have uh, um, i'm sure plenty of answers for those kind of questions um, but i i'm really more committed to the process of the commitment to healthy love for ourselves and how do we develop that and how did I have to develop that? Uh, you know, I was, as Tammy said, I was conceived underneath the Hollywood sign and I was born into, uh, you know, the last day, into the first day and December 30th coming into the year 1960. And I say that for a reason. I believe that I came here for this time you know, what's called the Aquarian Age. And uh, there's a lot of writing on the Aquarian Age. And I think that uh, we are in a more connected time where community is important. And that is why I am bringing all these teachings back to this community, to the recovery community, because the recovery community is a global community of co being connected and sharing our experience, strength, and hope with each other because of some addiction or some struggle. And that struggle, I'm going to say, is part of what is our human struggle, what you and I struggle with. And that uh, one of the, uh, I'm going to share a, uh, a big thing that I'm gonna be launching with you today, which I'm very excited about. And a lot, I know that there's a lot of healthy lovers who are here who have been committed to healthy love and who have been showing up uh, religiously for healthy love. And so uh, I'm really going, I'm giving out the big healthy love commitment today to everyone. Um, we'll get there. Um, but so uh, but, uh, but one of the quotes that I, I wanted to share with you that is really important about love. It was from Eric Fromm, who founded the humanistic, uh, uh, humanistic psychology and the humanistic movement uh, that happened in the 60s, and which was a big birth of consciousness for us here in the United States. And I know we're global and all over the world, uh, but there was a real birth of the whole psychology movement. And a lot of people fled from Germany and all over and came out of, and he came out of Nazi Germany actually, and fled to New York. And he said this, this is one of the quotes on love. Love is the only sane and satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. 
love is the only sane and satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. And so I'm going to build on that. And I'm going to say that the first step of the Healthy Love Program based on the 12 steps, like every other 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous, which we know is a we program, not an I program. The first word of the first step is we. And so we're not meant to do it alone. We're meant to do it together. And that's part of the community movement. That's why we recover our healthy selves in a community space. We need that. We need the sport. I need you. You need me. We need to share our experience, strength, and hope with each other and build on wisdom. And so the first step of healthy love, we admitted we were powerless over our personal struggle that made our relationships unhealthy. So first we'd have to admit that our relationships are unhealthy in the ways that they are, whatever we struggle with. And that what is our personal our own personal struggle, because you and I have something built into being human. You know, one thing that makes us whole, one thing that makes us one in all religions, they say you and I are one. Well, how are you and I one? Well, the way you and I are one is that every quality that it takes to be a human being lives in me and it lives in you. And if to be healthy is to be whole, then I have to love every part of me that lives within me, that lives within you. And the problem begins and ends there because we're born into a family and into a family story where all kinds of parts of our human self were cut off or denied or suppressed or hidden or shamed or guilted and they're projected onto us and acted out of our defense system. And so our human struggle begins in our childhood. Addiction, I don't think that we are born with addiction. So I believe that, yes, is it the question of nature and nurture? It's a big question, nature and nurture, because we're born into a family story and we live our family story. And if addiction and alcoholism and, um, and womanizing and um, self-mutilation um, and uh, predators, being a predator or being molested or whatever has been in our human history, in our family story, will come through into our lives and what do we, what, how it comes through to us and how we develop and how we grow as a human in relationship will be shaped by our family story and our human struggle with being raised to get rid of parts of ourselves, like being a liar. If you lie and you're a good person, you don't lie. So if you're three years old and you say, and your mom asks you, um, or, you know, did you eat that cookie? And you know it's not good to eat the cookie. You go, no, I didn't eat that cookie. Every child does that. And if you're a good mother, you'll say, don't lie. You ate that cookie. And we will start learning that being a liar is bad. And we'll start learning that each part of us, if we grow and, and we're lazy and lazy is bad or loud is bad or, or being too smart is bad because you don't want to intimidate your brother. So all of these parts of ourselves are called are aspects of ourselves that make up our shadow. So in the first step of healthy love, we have to know ourselves. We have to know our human design. We have to understand, and like I said, there are so many manuals now and so many teachers to help us understand our love, our languages for love, our five rhythms, our um, character, you know, our, our defenses, which I teach a lot about in the first step, is learning to understand you have a built-in defense system as part of your survival intelligence. It's there to help you survive, but it may turn on you when it comes to love. And so our first struggle is with our defense system and learning how to work with our defense system. 
our personal struggle is our own story and the becoming a victim in our story and a shadow of ourselves. So understanding that healthy love that can only flourish when we understand where we're unhealthy. And that's a difficult thing to admit. And that's why the first two words of the first step is we admitted. We admitted where we struggle. Because the ego, especially if you're a perfectionist, if you're, especially if you're meant to look good, then you can't admit that there's something wrong. Now, if you, you, you're somebody that thinks that everything's wrong with you, then it's going to be hard to admit that you have light and that you have goodness. So um, where we struggle is the first step of healthy love and our ability to admit that. But the, our ability to admit that in a space that's safe, and that's why people go to therapists, to work on helping to understand what's wrong with me or why do I keep repeating this over and over again? Why do I keep ending up in this relationship? And so I know that those are a lot of the questions we'll want to answer, but first we have to understand what we're dealing with, what the real dilemma is in deciding and de deciphering what, our, what we're struggling with. And so that is the first step for healthy love. Um, I, I know that I, I could go on and on about this, which I will, but I want to come back to you, Tammy, and allow you to continue uh, asking me questions. So, so we have a few questions, and you may get to some of these as, um, so I, I will tell you what they are, and then you can go, we're going to get to that. So, so one of them was, how do we get both partners on the same page? Another is, I've been struggling for years with negative self-talk, just kind of like you just mentioned. How do, um, how do I stop that? It's really detrimental. Okay, let and, me take one. Wait, 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 wait. Sure. Let me just take one question at a time. Sure. Shall we start I'm with the sorry, first? How do you get both I, partners on the same off. page? And for um, those of you trying to pop into the request to share, just a reminder that we're not, uh, do, this is not a typical meeting space. Rachel does have that on Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And I invite you to do that, but you can IM questions to me and I'll be happy to read them to Rachel for your, and she will answer them for you, so. Yeah, thank you, Tammy. So, so the question is, how do you get two people? How do you get partners on the same page? Um, it's a good question because they're too so what I like to say to that is that I'm a world and you're a world and so we need a bridge to connect us and so how do you get on the same page when you're not even speaking the same language and where you're not really even communicating with each other you're communicating at each other so there are some very basic skills that need to be developed to be on the same page together. You need to have the ability to put up your pages and say, well, this is my page. And the other person, your partner needs to be able to say, well, this is my page. And then how do we build, this is called the third way. You know, if, there, if there's only two, if there's only two ways, you know, if there's only two ways, pick the third. So if it's my way or your way, it ain't going to work. It never works. That's the problem of relationship. And that's the personal struggle. That's the relational struggle is the, the inability to seek to understand because we don't hear each other and we want our way to be the way because we're sure it's the right way. And so... There's no way, I mean, that's what mediators are for and conflict resolution is for, is how to listen to each other. And if you can't get on the same page, then you need to support in learning how to hear each other and be willing to drop your agenda. Because by dropping the agenda and seeking to understand where the other's coming from and them feeling heard and understood, then they're gonna relax. And then they're going to drop their agenda and say, well, wait a minute, thank you for hearing me and finally understanding me. Let me now understand what you, where you're coming from. But one person has to be willing to drop their agenda to hear the other before you can get to the third way. So we can build on that as a foundation for that answer. So 
you can bring in more questions. I think that that's where I'll, I'll begin with that. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, no, it is. But And I think it is it is challenging, particularly if you, you've got two wounded people and they're trying to navigate it. You know, it, it is challenging. And so you, you mentioned having, you know, a, a mediator, a coach, a therapist, somebody who can help um, manage the relationship and help each person see that because it can be difficult. So the next question is, I've been struggling for years with negative self-talk. How do you stop it? It's really detrimental. Um, I kind of want to go back to the last thing you said. Um, <laughs> I think that, yes, I think I just want to say the last thing about, you know, as an Imago relationship therapist uh, and being the bridge for, for couples until they could build their bridge, uh, that is an essential, that's a set of skill building uh, that if anybody who's listening wants to know what I'm talking about, that Harville Hendricks and Helen, his wife, Helen LaKelly Hunt, uh, developed a whole body of work for Imago Relationship Therapy built on the book called Getting the Love You Want. It's a very great resource. And then there's a whole community called Safe Conversations as another uh, resource to help learn how to how to dialogue and how to have safe conversations okay so then moving along to the second question about negative self-talk and and that um and how do you deal with negative self-talk uh well that that is a big 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 question because um that negative self-talk comes out of a negative it comes out of your story about yourself and it is a story that you're very committed to and so in that story about who you are there's a dialogue that you live in and so in shadow work and in and, and this whole work that i'm going to be doing called story you know working with writing our stories together uh getting to know that we have a story we are not our story but we have a story and learning to identify those voices. So the internal voices and the internal dialogue. So we have, we have a higher self. You have a higher self, I have a higher self. Uh, that higher self, that conscious self that I speak of in healthy love uh, that takes the elevator up from the primitive brain, uh, the reptilian brain that's in reaction, uh, that comes out of our defense system, that is in our wounded story, uh, from our childhood wounds, which you mentioned, Tammy, uh, that has that dialogue going on. Why we do conscious work, why it's essential to do conscious work, just like going to the gym to build your muscles to be healthy and strong, just like everything we do for our immune system, especially in a time of being afraid of a virus, is we have to build, uh, and we have to be healthy and strong. So how do you become healthy and strong so that you are kind of impervious in a way and uh, that you have this this healthy shield of light or a healthy immune system. How do you build that? I believe consciousness is about that. I believe in, in higher consciousness and I believe that in the light of higher consciousness and that that light, we can shine that light on the darkness of that internal dialogue. We can transform it. But first things first, you'd have to know your own light. You'd have to have met your own light and know that it isn't something outside of you only, but it's something within you. It's part of your consciousness and it's your higher awareness. And yes, does that higher consciousness connect to teachers and preachers and thinkers and um, healers and light workers and you know all the places we get inspiration from today where we help to raise our consciousness or raise our thinking um, our therapists that help us reframe reflect our story to us so that we can hear ourselves and go oh my god i wouldn't say that to a child that i'm raising or maybe i would unconsciously 
See, that's really the truth. We really do unconsciously speak to others the way we don't want to be spoken to. And it's really sad and tragic um, that we can't see it and we can't until we can. And it's a trick of the ego. See, doing conscious work and shadow work is the hardest work. It's the work of the heart warrior because we have to put ourselves in situations and intensives and in processes that we're willing to see what we haven't been able to see. So uh, Course in Miracles says a miracle is a shift in perception. To be able to see a miracle is like seeing the mirage, being able to see what we haven't been able to see. But our conscious mind is being able to see ourselves in a way we haven't been able to see and see our wounded self, not from our shame, where, yeah, I see it and it hurts me and I'm so pained and I'm so bad and I'm so terrible and everybody hates me. No, not that kind of seeing. Seeing from our higher self that sees it and says, oh, I see you acting out and being in your self-pity. And I see you acting out and being in your shame. And it doesn't shame you for it, but it doesn't join you in it. It sees you. And once you develop that ability to see from your conscious mind to your wounded self, you see I point from here to here, here to here it's so, it lives somewhere within us it does it's activated by different parts of our brain this is being proven through brain science we know this today we know we have the fight or flight response so this negative dialogue that you live in gets triggered you don't live in it 24 7 but when it get that switch gets flipped and you get triggered it's a radio station it's your radio and it's on that dial of shame or it's on that dial of guilt and it's on that dial of finger pointing at you and you don't know how to get out of it. And so knowing ourselves is the pathway of healthy love. There's so much to learn. I'm still learning. So I would say that that's, Okay, another way to stop your internal negative dialogue. Have you seen the movie Moonstruck? Yes. You remember? Yeah. Snap out of it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you can do that too, if that works. But usually we need loving kindness and we need somebody to hold us and say, oh, I'm so sorry. That's what we're usually reaching out for is some kind of kindness or empathy that wants to understand us and say, I understand why you're in so much pain and make sense out of that negative self-talk. And that's usually why we find the therapist, the sponsor, the teacher to go to that creates a safe space to hold us and reflect to us. I understand that. Is that working for you that you keep saying that to yourself though? And the fact that you hung up on that person and barked at them, do you want to leave it like that? Do you think there's something that you need to do to clean that up? So that's our work in healthy love. But it's, you know, it's step work. It's one baby, one step at a time and learning how, how we're designed and learning how to work with our system in relationship. I wrote down, we are not our story, but we have a story. And I thought that that's really an important thing. And that was actually very useful for me. What I learned to do, because I had a lot of that negative self-talk too, is I was able to identify with help, you know, where that negative voice came from. My, I love my father, but he, you know, uh, it was definitely him. I had it this week where I did something, you know, it was, you know, it was just one of those things. And I immediately, the, the negative voices and, but now I can go, you know, that's that old pattern, like your dad. And so, you know, like you talked about it, it I, I can, I have learned to be able to shift it and go, wait, is, is that the right lens to look at this? It wasn't my best move ever. No, but you know, was it like the, you know, I'm the most biggest idiot of the world No, you know? So, so being able to reframe it, understanding where that negative voice came from was super helpful for me too. 
I want to I want to re reflect something back that you just shared. Um, that ability to identify it, which I say, name it, claim it, and tame it. That's the three-step shadow process, really. Uh, Debbie Ford called it unconcealing, owning, and embracing each part of you. But naming it is really important. The naming it, and claiming it, and taming it, and saying it was that the best move? Was that the best thing? No. All right. But were you the biggest idiot? No. That ability. See, what you just reflected back, Tammy, is that what we develop, and see, you develop that in doing your work, is developing the process that knows how to have that kind higher self that, that can speak like that, can ask you those questions, that kind higher self that gets developed with others that, that show you the way to do that until you could do it for yourself. And so being able to interrupt it, that's our own intervention, that's the divine intervention of being able to, to get to a place where we can do it for ourselves. And it may take a thousand times and a thousand processes to get there. Uh, because where that negative self-talk comes from is where it came from in the first place. And so, you know, somebody shamed us in a moment because they were in a bad mood, but we turned it, or they, or they were having a bad day, or they were depressed or something, and we turned it as a child, and we picked up the bat, and we carried that bat, and we kept beating ourselves up with it and re-experiencing it. That's the number one resentment that we carry is we keep re-sensing our experience to family mother members, whether it's a, a, a family st a, a story that happened. You know, you were just sitting in your room on your own, on your bed, and then your mother comes rushing in and screaming in front of you to your father, and, and this is a drama of somebody that I know that it happened to, and and as a child, you're just sitting there, speechless. You can't say anything. And you have to witness this dramatic, painful, acting out, worst day of your life. And you, in that moment, make a decision as a child, or maybe you've already made the decision, I can't say anything. Then that belief, that shadow belief, becomes a root magnet in your story that you are powerless over and that you act out over and over again in situations. And all of a sudden you are reduced to an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old or a two-year-old. You're no longer in your, my, you know, 59-year-old body. You know, you're reduced back to that wound. And that is what is happening, why people aren't on the same page with each other, because they have to go through the adulting process to mature. And so, you know, this process of maturing is saying, I can speak to my child self, my wounded self. I can help that wounded self say, no, you're not the biggest stupid idiot in the world. It's okay. You're all right. Not, not such a, it wasn't such a hot move, but not so terrible. And you find a way to soothe, to self-soothe. You find your way to come back to the present moment. You get out of that negative story. And then you even maybe have an action step of what to do to clean it up in the present. And when you live in your wounded story, you never get to clean up any, anything up in the present because you're always stuck in your history. And that's why we do this work. That's why we're here committed to the recovery journey of our healthy selves, to get present. But I want to give hope to the person. If I learned it, you can learn it. And it doesn't mean that it'll be perfect because, you know, I've been sober a few 24 hours and 
you know, I still have those negative voices come up. I have just learned to do that. And exactly what you said, too. I did learn that it was an old childhood wound. And so I learned as an adult to be able to reach back and go, you know, I need to just soothe that that little girl and just go, you know, it's going to be OK. And you know, all of those things. But there are practical tools um, that help us to help us change those voices. I'm old enough to be able to go to replace those tapes. You know, I don't know what the, <laughs> the right, right uh, now. Now they're, now, but, now they're MP3. There you go. There you go. So, but, but <laughs> you can do it. So ready for another question? Oh, go ahead. I, I wanted to thank you because we need to speak to that. And I want to speak to that by adding one other thing, one other important truth about what you're saying about the hope of knowing why we stay the course of this journey and why I'm still here because I'm teaching what I need to learn. And I think it's been, what we need is, is the repetition and we need to hear it over and over again. And that the tools that we're, that we're developing together to name what the tools are and to know that today what the tools, we can make a list of them, which if you are beautiful, thank you. Please capture them and send them to me because what we're going to co-create together in the Healthy Love Program is sharing um, our collective wisdom together. And the tools that you're picking up on today, I really want you to, to, to make note of them. Like one of the things that you just said, Tammy, that we reflected back from uh, something that I'm teaching a lot is called self-soothing. It's a tool. Mm -hmm. And so somebody has to have that distinction. What, what is self-soothing? What does that even mean? Because um, they didn't even get it when they needed it as a baby. You know? So wh what does soothing look like? What does it feel like? How do you use a soothing voice? What is a soothing touch? What is the power of soothing? Uh, what are soothing words? It's okay. It's going to be okay. That's all we need to hear. I understand. See, those are more tools. How do we get the words? When we had a parent who didn't have a word, were those words themselves. So how could they have given it to us? And all the time that we're teaching in this kind of way, you know, somebody's not only listening as a child, but they're listening as a parent. And they're shaming themselves for what they didn't do for their child. And so... We have to speak on so many levels to stop the shame because that's what our personal struggle really is. Each one, you and I, is shame, guilt, and fear. Those are the three root causes of unhealthy love is shame, guilt, and fear. And fear, we know, I just did a whole teaching on this the other night in Healthy Love. It's one of my daily doses of Healthy Love. And I'm just going to say it here. And I am going to have to use the F word. Um, but uh, I was raised with a lot of cursing. And I used to always say to my father, do you want to curse us or do you want to bless us? So even as a little kid, I knew that. Um, even though I followed him right on his path, you know. Uh, I always say that up until 11 years old, I used to break his cigarettes in half. And then at 11 years old, I finally lit one. And then if we can't beat them, we join them. And so, you know, and then I cursed myself until I, 18 years old, you know, I got burnt out by the time I was 18 from my addiction. And I brought myself onto the path of transformation. So, you know, I am great hope for anyone here that staying the course, you can have healthy love and a healthy life, but it does take years and years and years of, of, of commitment. Um, but here's, what, here's the teaching about fear. And I love recovery wisdom so much. That's why I came back as a therapist to build the program here and to, to 12, of 12 Steps for Healthy Love. And I love recovery wisdom. And this is right out of recovery wisdom, so it's not my genius. Uh, and and is, is fear. Um, fear. Fear is from our defense system. And fear teaches us to say, fuck everything and run. Right? And then there's another acronym for fear. And I am looking it up because my brain just went uh, blank. And I'm going to give it to you. Um, 
So fuck everything and run. Or face everything and recover. I know one of my healthy lovers is going to give it to me, right? Please. Yes, that's, but there's another one. There's three. All right. I know everyone remembers that one. See, everyone remembers that one. They, I had three responses and they all remember that one. That's the, that's the whole purpose. Just remember that one. But anyways, be, between. Isn't it false evidence appears thank real? You. Okay. Thank you. Okay. There you go. So. Thank you. you. Hang around 12 step long enough. You learn a few things. <laughs> See, you hang around long enough. You learn the language. And it is a language of, of recovery wisdom. And so that's it. False evidence appearing real. So false evidence appearing real. So you take something and you make it mean something else because you project it. That's a defense mechanism of the ego, which I teach all about. That's at the foundation of, we have Freud defined 12 defense mechanisms. Isn't that interesting, 12? Um, and that the main, I mean, denial, we know denial is don't even notice I am lying. That's what recovery is built on. That's what addiction is built on. We don't even know we're lying to ourselves. But projection is such a powerful one. And that we take false evidence that appears real because what we make it mean because we're the meaning makers. And what we do is we make it mean what we want it to mean, not what we, our healthy selves, want it to mean. We, our wounded selves, want it to mean. So that's another teaching, is that what we have to learn is the meaning we give things. Based on certain evidence, we take a piece of evidence. And what we make it mean, we blow it into our own story. And you know how you do that. You know how somebody doesn't show up and all of a sudden, they're cheating on you. Or all of a sudden, they're, um, you, you have them pick up their phone, and all of a sudden, they're speaking to that person that they promised they'd never speak to again. You know, so you make up the story because your fear believes that and looks. And, and they're just picking up their phone, but it triggers what you want to believe because you keep trying to prove it to prove that you're right and you're going to catch something. So false evidence appearing real is fear. Knowing that in our fight or flight that either we freeze, we submit, we run, or we fight. Now the fighters don't say fuck everything and run. They say they go in the opposite direction, right? So fear either motivates us to fight or to run or to freeze or to submit. And so fear, shame, and guilt, we know, is at the root of our story. It's at the root of what we have to work with in, in our meaning, in, the, in our wounded meanings. So thank you, healthy lovers, for all your support and uh, coming to the rescue. We have a bunch more questions. So ready for another one? Ask away. OK, what are the best ways to foster healthy love in a relationship where trust has been broken and is being rebuilt? OK, so I just always love to breathe in to, uh, as a healthy love practice. And so right now, I'd like to just have you who are listening, who are present and connected to breathe in to and breathe in because there's a lot to be digested. And uh, I'd like for you to say that one more time, Tammy, with what you said, sure. the full thing. What are the best ways to foster healthy love in a relationship where trust has been broken and is being rebuilt? Yes, wonderful. So, and face everything and rise. Thank you, Barbara. So let's add that to it. Um, so, so that question of when, when you're in the repair stage and you're repairing trust, um, you're repairing it on top of going more deeply into the wounded space. 
And so it's such a delicate dance, it really is. Because every time we act out our pain and we get triggered, it's probably because another piece of our pain needs to be expressed. And so that's part of the repair process. If we, if we um, commit to that. See, once you commit to closing the exit doors and saying, I'm committed to working through this with you, and your partner says, and I'm committed to working through this with you, and building trust together, what we first have to know is that there's a dynamic that created what happened in the first place. Not as of a blame, but as a dynamic of the victim and the victimized, you know, that somehow we have to own our part in how we co-created, how we somehow co-created the dynamic of what happened. So I would say that that is a, an imperative first step in, in laying down the foundation of, for building the trust, is knowing that we teach, take responsibility for what happened and 100% for what our part was. And that when we get triggered, we have to own it. And to say, you know what, I just am pissed off. I saw you, um, you know, on, on, on Facebook and I saw that they commented or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Or I know that you had to go to that meeting and I know that they were at that meeting and it's, I'm pissed off and I know you probably had to talk to them. And we may need to suffer through having to hear about it over and over again and i would say that that's my answer i had to come to what the answer is and so the answer is to have the um tenacity the commitment the perseverance the willingness to hear it over and over have the pain resurface over and over again and have to be expressed and and do it in a safe dialogue, in a safe conversation, in a healthy dialogue, that you receive it or your partner receives it, is willing to receive it for the 492nd time, because it might take 992 to no longer need to come up again. And however many times it took to get to the damaged place you got to is probably how long it will take to get to the healthy place where you've built trust because trust is built through a reparation process of healthy dialogue of conscious dialogue and the developing the capacity to build a bridge of safety build a bridge of empathy where you trigger and you're reactive and I don't have to go, oh, you're react, you're doing that again? No. I go, oh my God, I see you're reactive. I'm sorry you're suffering. I'm going to breathe and be the one. You know, we say it's the 11th step prayer, right? It's better, you know, make me an instrument. Make me the one that can forgive and to be forgiven. Make me the one that can receive and hold and be the one to love than the one that has to be triggered. Let me be, you know, I have to tell you that what finished off my work that allowed me to be here with you, to believe that I could even start a 12-step program and have that audacity to think that I could start a 12-step program, is that having done all the work that I did from the time I was 18 years old, um, the final piece of work I had to do was in my relationship. And so that was my final frontier. And I met Henry, my husband, uh, in a parking lot of a 12-step meeting called Miracles Happen. I don't think that's an accident. I think that was in divine order. And, um, and I parked right next to him. And he fell in love with me the minute he saw me in my tight white jeans, but I didn't know that. And um, that was many moons ago. And um, I could cry thinking about it. 
And uh, it was a long journey that we were on to heal. And it was a healing journey that we committed to and that our souls were committed to. And so in that moment, there was a knowing and a recognition. He had it, you know, I didn't yet. Usually one partner does. And because there's a journey that we're meant to take. And now that I'm getting emotional and I'm, I, I know I want, to, I want to connect the dot of why I was sharing this with you because there is a really important point that I, that I wanted to make. And Tammy, maybe you can remember the point that I wanted to make why I went into sharing this story. It, it's about rebuilding trust and how do we, how do we um, foster healthy love while we're rebuilding trust that was broken. Yeah. So, oh, thank you. Okay, so I, I just needed a moment to get back. So, um, so even though I began, I had been in transformation since I was 18 and I was now 25 um, in the parking lot. And, and it was two years later that we got married. I was in that moment, in that meeting, I went in and I wasn't really in addiction. I didn't think of myself as somebody who was in addiction. But I went into a 12-step meeting because of my cousin and, and I had just moved to Miami from LA and a huge meeting. And I went in and I was sitting down, there must have been a hundred people there in this meeting called Miracles Happen. It was on a Sunday night and I heard the recovery. I heard the truth. I heard the honesty. I felt something. I knew I belonged. At the end, I raised my hand and I picked up a white chip and I went on the path of recovery and I spent 12 years me meetings, meetings, meetings. And, you know, until I became a therapist and followed Debbie Ford into shadow work for 12 years. And I was married all that time. And you would think with all that work, I don't know if this is going to discourage you or give you hope, but um, out of all that time that I would have gotten healthy love, but oh no, even with all the shadow work that I'd done, I was still fighting like cats and dogs. I was still defensive in my relationship with Henry. And he was a fighter just like me. So we would go at it to like three in the morning if we had to some, some, at some points. And yeah, maybe it got a little better, but not much. And then a miracle happened. And this is the miracle. I decided that if I was going to work with couples and I knew about, I heard, heard about Imago therapy, Imago relationship therapy. And, um, and this was in 93 and, um, and I decided, you know what, I, I'm going to do this work and I'm going to learn this work. And he became a partner in the work with me. And he went to, he became my love lab in the Love Lab experiment. And that's why I'm gonna invite you all into the Love Lab experiment for all the healthy love bunnies here, all the love rabbits, all the lab rats um, that have been showing up to healthy love. Um, but he became, he became that we in this grand experiment and he showed up and, and went through that process with me. And we learned, we were trained in my training in this process called conscious dialogue. And conscious dialogue is what, what healthy love is built upon. It's what I get have the privilege of doing every day with individuals and couples. If I'm working with an individual, then I'm the one that gets to hold the conscious dialogue. If I'm working with a couple, then I support them in building the bridge with each other. And the three of us, I'm the bridge holder in teaching conscious dialogue. And so, I know this very long answer to get to the place of knowing that um, it took all those years to finally, to finally know how to receive. And so that's the final piece I want to give you in this very long winded answer um, of how do you repair or rebuild trust in a relationship? Because many of you are here who have that experience who have are needing to build trust and needing to repair and it's learning how to stay and 
in a conscious dialogue and how to learn the skills of a conscious dialogue and have a partner who's willing to learn those skills. And when the one of you is triggered to have the other one say, I'm willing to receive you. I'm willing to hear you and cross the bridge into your world. That ability to have conscious dialogue helps to heal, helps to heal the wounded space. So we're well, out of time. So I guess we, we need to let them get to their 12 steps. Thank you, Rachel. For those of you that we didn't get to your questions, j join Rachel on Thursday nights at 9 p.m. on Eastern time and come back in an hour. Lulu here. will be on. For hey, the Tammy, wait, 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 Tammy, wait, wait a second. I had no idea. I had we only have an hour. hour. We, we only have an hour. Oh, I thought it was two hours. No, one, we have one hour and then they go to their 12 step and then we come back for Lulu's. So. So, oh, because I have something I wanted to give them. Join, join. Okay. So join. listen, if you have a text, if you have a text phone, if come, if you want the healthy love commitment, come to the meeting on Thursday night. There you go. Join Rachel on Thursday night, 9 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, everybody. Bye.